You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bulmer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoScheduleman.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. I've been known to struggle with reality. Hi, I'm Kevin Bulmer. Thanks for listening. Had uh, great fun and really am grateful for the feedback that we got on the first episode of this podcast that I recorded with my good friend Derek Rockbotten. You can go back and listen to that on our YouTube channel or on SoundCloud as well. You can also download the podcast on SoundCloud uh, at soundcloud.com backslash no schedule man. That was a lot of fun. It was fun to just finally take something that had been on my list for a long time and just get started. And, you know, I was thinking about that even more as it pertains to the guest of today's program, Mike Mulligan of Moving Forward Rehabilitation and Wellness Center. And you'll see when you hear from Mike how the whole idea of just getting going and getting started and overcoming challenges is a really powerful theme for this particular show. I, I got to encourage you, I'm going to encourage you that if you've got something, and we all do, that you, you've always wanted to try, you've always wanted to see that you can do to just try to get started. Just take the first step. Take a book out of the library and read about it. Ask somebody, but just talk about it out loud. Do something to take a step toward making it real because we all have these things. I've had long lists of them. This very podcast has been on that list literally for years. And what waits on the other side of that, the yin to this yang, are excuses. All these reasons that we keep telling us that we can't or we shouldn't or shouldn't And the excuses usually go like, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money, I've got a busy career, I've got kids, I've got family. Well, a lot of us have that stuff, I certainly do as well, but really they're just excuses. Here's something that I got through my head by reading in a book called Five Wishes by Gay Hendricks. He poses the scenario of imagining yourself at the end of your life. And when you think about that, that could be later this afternoon... It could be 50 years from now or somewhere a greater number than that or lesser. We just don't know. And that's the plain reality. We don't know. Well, imagine you're at the end of your life and you know you are. You're looking back on your life. Was it a success or was it not? If you even paused for a minute before saying yes, if there's even sort of that little inkling in the back of your mind, in your gut, in your soul, in your spirit that thinks maybe not, why not? And that's the thing that I would encourage you to go and get started. Just take the first step and then have the courage to just let the path show itself to you along the way. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of succeeding. We're afraid of what other people might think of us. I'm the same as you are. But I had so much fun with just that one podcast with Derek. If I never even do another one, I already feel like I've got my money's worth out of it and my time's worth because it's been so much fun. Another way of saying it is just jump out of the airplane. If you've got enough courage to do that, You're going to have a heck of a ride either way, and you're going to have some real good motivation for trying to figure out how to open the parachute on the way down. So I finally got started with this, the No Schedule Man uh, podcast. I've also got another big project that I've got on the go, a rock band bucket list project called Mutineer. I'll talk more about that another time. Meantime, if you're curious about that, you can look up Mutineer Band on Facebook or go to mutineer.ca and you can fill yourself in on that. And talk about getting started. This guy is the king of that. I admire him so much. My guest today is Mike Mulligan. Mike is the, the owner and the creator, the visionary of a place called Moving Forward Rehabilitation and Wellness Center here in London, Ontario. But it, it's so much more than that, Mike's story and why I admire him so much. I first met Mike a couple of years ago, but he's one of those people that as soon as I met him, I felt like I'd known him forever. Mike's story is is an interesting one. He was paralyzed in a car accident at the age of 16. That accident left him with a broken neck and as a C4 quadriplegic, but that didn't stop him from continuing to to go through life. He went on and finished high school. Uh, He went on to get a university degree. He got a terrific job, bought a house, got a vehicle, which was modified to be able to let him drive independently. He didn't stop the physical challenges that he had, or he didn't allow the physical challenges that he had to stop him from traveling all throughout the United States and Australia. So Mike has done that. In 2010, 
Mike first heard about a center out in California in the United States that was specializing in spinal cord injury recovery. And uh, he ended up going out there and making a really interesting discovery. I don't want to tell too much of that story here because I'm going to let Mike do that. But suffice it to say, the whole collective experience led Mike to be inspired to create what is now Moving Forward Rehabilitation and Wellness Center here in London, Ontario, Canada. And even more important than that, Mike remains as vigilant as ever at achieving his own personal goals while helping a whole lot of other people along the way. I think you're really going to enjoy hearing what Mike has to say in his story, and it's going to make you think about yourself as well. Here's my conversation with Mike Mulligan. I was what we, we I was your normal teenager, um, even kid growing up. We we I grew up in St. Mary's, Ontario, just north of London, and um, yeah, it was me, my brother, and my sister. So my brother's four years younger than me, my sister's seven years younger than me, and uh, we were pretty we were pretty close. We kind of grew up outside of St. Mary's, so we were kind of had a little forest behind our house, so it was kind of free reign to just kind of run around the bush, make forts, do all that sort of stuff ride mountain bikes go cross country skiing so i was kind of your average teenager i loved activities being outside it was a lot of fun my dad's a truck driver and i mean my childhood was kind of like the summer break was driving around with him in the in, the, in his truck got all over kind of canada the united states and so that was a lot of fun growing up you get to see a lot of country that you know an average 12 year old 13 year old doesn't get to see. So. I'm thinking about the episode of The Simpsons when uh, Homer challenges Red Barkley to the meat eating competition, and Red has too much meat and dies, and Homer decides to take his truck away, and Bart goes with him. You didn't have one of those things where the the little box where the truck drove itself, did it? Probably no, not back then. Not at all. No. No. <laughs> and no. You're I'm me- sure my dad would have liked that though. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagining you like sitting with Homer. I've never met your dad, so I hope that that's not wildly offensive to him. It's no. a good episode. You just have yeah. to take my uh, it's, Mike's giving me a glazed over look about. Okay. Uh, well, my dad's <laughs> bald. He kind of does look like Homer a little bit. So. <laughs> and beyond that, it was just a breeze going across the country as a trucker. And, and it was. Did you have the hat with the mesh back and everything? No, 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 no. And did you no, get the we, tan only on your forearm? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. My brother would go, but, you know, me and my dad will joke that my brother was usually in the bunk sleeping. So I was usually his co-pilot. And my brother was in the back sleeping in the bunk. So that was kind of our childhood was, you know, dad was on the road. So, you know, to kind of spend time with him was going with him that's kind of how we got to spend time with him as a kid so is your dad still around he is yep sounds yep. like you guys are close yeah we're very close yeah he's you know and it's crazy he's 60 years old still long haul trucking across the country and uh you know and he loves it i mean it's taking a toll on his body but i don't think he would ever do anything else that's what he loves so yeah what are some of the other things that you really like to do back then Um, really, like I said, growing up kind of out in the country when we were young was just being outside. You know, it's kind of hard for me to see kids nowadays playing video games and being in all all the time because growing up, it was you, we were outside, we were climbing trees and, you know, making, like I said, making forts and bike trails through the, through the, through the bush. And we were outside until it was dark. And even then we were probably still outside, you know, and, um, even in the winter time, it was like, okay, my hands are really blue. It's probably time to go in. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was always outside, very active. And that's kind of always been very weird to me with today's generation of kids is, you know, you're in front of a TV all the time. Well, I'm happy to say that I think that you've grown up in my opinion, because, uh, if you were used to being outside until your hands were blue and even then it hadn't <laughs> occurred to you to go in, you've come a long way given that I came here into the, the gym and you were all huddled up oh, right yeah. by the front door. Oh I'm, boy, it's cold. I, ever since my accident, <laughs> I hate the cold. It's, uh, I think every year it's from the first snowflake to the last. I'm, I'm not a winter person at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. find me somebody who is. They yeah. are out there, you know. They do exist. I know. I know. You know, those people that love snowmobiling, they, you know, God bless their soul. They love being outside. But, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, we don't necessarily think about some people that have more challenges in getting around. It's tough enough in the, the snow in the winter time. But we'll maybe come back around to that. You mentioned the wheelchair. So let's get to that. Take me to 1996. And as much as you feel comfortable describing, what happened? 
Um, I was, uh, so my accident happened June 15th, 1996. And it'll be a day I, I never really will ever forget. And it's a day I actually celebrate. Um, as the years have gone by, I, I look at it as um, Mike 2.0. It was kind of a, a start over at life. Not that I was going in the wrong direction with the way my life was going, um, but obviously there was a reason why it happened. Uh, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason, and you know a lot of people will disagree with that. You know they can't handle things in their life, um, but for me, um, it, it was a tough day. I mean, obviously I was at a at a party, my boss's uh, buck and doe. I had just got my license um, to drive on my own. My parents felt okay that I could take the car. And um, so I drove out there. My, my mom and dad had kind of strict rules of, you know, make sure you stay to the main highways, make sure no one's with you, to, you know, for distractions. And so when I drove out there, I mean, that's, that's what I did. And um, I had a great time while I was out there. My curfew was midnight. While I was there, you know, I had a coworker that lived in St. Mary's, kind of not very far, kind of just down the hill from me. And so he asked me, you know, like, you knew I was going back home and I drove out there and he says to me, Mike, you know, can I get a ride home? And I said, yeah, I said, I'm not supposed to, but you know what? It'll be on the way. I'll drop you off first. My parents will never know. So kind of when we left from there, I don't really remember too much more. Uh, it kind of got the, the blanks have gotten filled in by paramedics and police and everything like that. But um, so I took a back road again. One of the rules I broke of my parents that they, you know, were strict on like stay, staying to the main roads, the road that left St. Paul's took you right into St. Mary's. And I don't know if why I took it, what, what made me take it. You know what? I will we'll never know. Um, but I took this road. It was a gravel road, fairly up and down. Um, you kind of go through different, you know, um, concessions of, you know, the, the, the road. And from what I have heard was I was just going down, uh, the section of the road that was packed gravel. So it's like driving on asphalt. As we came through an intersection, it was freshly graded gravel, which is more or less like driving on marbles if you're going too fast whether i was going too fast it was determined that i was um i hit it lo losing control and ended up more or less from like i said getting the information pieced back together from the opp um accident construction uh department was more or less i cartwheeled the car through the ditch like a 20 foot embankment flipped the car went between two trees, more or less ripping the mirrors off each side, skipping across the river and landing on the roof on the other side. So it's more or less something you'd see on Fast and the Furious. Um, and those guys walk out. Unfortunately, I didn't. And going back, you know, yes, I wasn't supposed to have anybody with me, but thank goodness I did. Um, because he was able to get out of the car to go get help. Um, again, I don't really know where he went. Obviously, it was probably the nearest house, the nearest farm. And that's when the fire department and the ambulance, you know, showed up and the police. Uh, and then from there, because I was on my roof on the riverbank and it was June, um, it was fairly wet. So they tried to use um, the airbags to pump the van or the, the car up so that they could get at me. Um, as they did that, when they tried to raise up the front, it was kind of sinking the back. So they ended up having to use two sets of airbags to lift the front and the back so that they could get the car up an even amount and then using the jaws of life to get me out. Um, again, like I said, I don't really remember any of this, but um, one of our good friends, he was on the volunteer fire department for St. Mary's. So he was the one that actually um, went to go get, you know, more or less told the police, you know what, I know Mike's parents and, and so did the police that showed up on site. He said, I think it would be best if I, if I was the one that showed up. So in the meantime, they had to, you know, put the, the C-spine uh, neck brace on me and get me out of the car. It was then when I got to St. Mary's, my, my parents were at the St. Mary's uh, general hospital in St. Mary's, um, that my parents were there. 
And, you know, I guess I was apologizing and saying, I'm so sorry, you know, that this, this has happened and, you know, and they're not really knowing what went wrong, but other just knowing that I was in a car accident, but it was kind of found from there that I had broke my neck and, oh my gosh, we need to get this guy to the London hospitals. So that was from there that I got more or less shipped, you know, as fast as possible in an ambulance at one, two, three o'clock in the morning uh, to London, Victoria on South Street to find out that, yes, I had broke my neck. C4-5, I wasn't moving anything. But going back to that, they don't really know if I broke my neck during the accident or the gentleman that was with me undid my seatbelt when we were hanging upside down trying to help me get out of the car when we were upside down. So they don't really know. I will never know. And you know what? It's one of those things that, you know what happened? So be it. Um, Do you know how long you were in the vehicle for after the crash before help arrived? No, I don't. No. Um, that's one thing I don't know. Like I, um, when the um, ambulance, uh, it was actually years later that I found all this out. Actually, I was actually doing one of those uh, first response courses where like they bring the high school kids into a hospital and more or less scare the shit out of them with you know, one of their classmates coming in on a, on a stretcher and they've done the makeup and they've, you know, made them look like they've been in an accident. And I was kind of the guest speaker to, you know, give my story. Sure. Um, and being there, it was kind of one of the questions like, you know, how did this happen? And I said, I don't really know. I said, I've kind of lost, I have kind of been blacked out of my mind. I don't really know. Luckily, it was actually one of the ambulance attendants that, you know, was involved in this whole recre- or, um, recreation or whatever for the high school students. He was actually on site. So he was actually the one that told the students what had happened and that the OPP, when they showed up on site, they couldn't figure out how I got from point A to point B knowing there's marks here, but how the heck did he get over across the river? So it was really one of those things that I was really hearing the story for the first time. And this was years after my accident. So it was kind of remarkable for me. But again, there's a lot of gaps in there that I don't really know myself. What was that like to hear that? A little scary. To tell you the truth, I was a little scared. I was a little ashamed knowing that I had done this, knowing that my parents, you know, probably were a little disappointed that I broke all their rules. Um, But again, my parents have always been really supportive of me. So they've never really held that against me Um, that this happened. It was their car. It was under their insurance. Um, I didn't listen to them. I didn't follow their rules. Um, (laughs) Knowing nowadays kids break a lot of rules. Um, But you know, like I was, I don't know. I've, it, it kind of hurt to tell you the truth. Yeah. To hear the story back. Yeah. I'm yeah. I'm interested too in if you even have an opinion. Why would you think that that whole passage is blacked out from your memory? I don't know. Um, I've always really wanted to know. Um, and it's always been one of those things. I've always been uh, afraid that I'm going to wake up one night and have like this. Re- recap of the whole thing kind of in a dream and um, more or less scare the shit out of me, you know, but it never has. And probably for the best, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad it really hasn't. Cause I don't know if I would really want to ever relive it to tell you the truth. Let's um, lighten it just a bit. And I want to take you back to something you said a few moments before you described the accident. And thank you for giving that. See, you gave such detail right up until you picked up this other person, and then it just kind of goes black, right? But yeah. here I'm hauling us backwards again. It's it's interesting that, but but then you come to a point where, like what you were saying a few minutes ago, that you feel like there was sort of Mike version one and then Mike version two point zero, and that there was a reason why this happened. And and what I took to be a very positive viewpoint out of a really dark situation. But I immediately wanted to ask you, and I'm going to ask you now. Okay. <laughs> Where it was, as best as you can recollect, along the timeline, that you started to feel that way? Um, How long did it take? What do you remember? To tell you the truth, it was right away. Really? Yeah. It was right away. You know how like a baby learns to do everything 
you know, from the start, that's what I felt like. I felt like I was almost like a newborn, um, laying in that bed, not being able to move, not being able to do anything. Um, that's really what I felt like. And then kind of from there, you know, with the involvement of therapy, the support of my family, the nurses, it's really, I started to, you know, move more, feed myself. So it was almost like the progression of how a baby does it, you know, like we always wonder like, what is a baby thinking? And it was more or less, that was what I was doing and I could express it and go through the emotions and, um, it was tough. It was tough laying there, not being able to move. But at the same time, I didn't really know what was going on. I knew I was in a hospital. Um, I knew the nurses were coming in to do things, but I didn't really understand it. I didn't really know what it meant, why I was here, but it was happening and I was going through it. I was doing it. What was your expectation at that time of how you were going to eventually come out of it and what you felt you, I mean, and to ask it a different way, how much did you understand about how physically limited you would be from that point forward? I, I, I didn't really know. It was really kind of some of my first real sessions of like, I would have these people come in and I'll, I'll I'm going to go back a little bit, but just really briefly, really, and really quick. Um, we had my surgery, but we couldn't do it until about four days after the accident because of the swelling in my neck. Um, and there's a little little story about that too, uh, trying to get me into the elevator and I had a halo on to kind of support my neck and everything else. I couldn't fit in the elevator because not that I'm a tall guy, but just the way the halo was, I couldn't, I had to take the halo off. So I had to rely on someone holding my head and not breaking my neck while we were just on the way to surgery um, or not break my neck, but doing more damage than was right. already done. Um, but <laughs> I was a huge fan of the X-Files growing up, you know, and I'm kind of glad it's coming back again. Um, but it was one of those things where I'm laying on this table and all of a sudden I just see all these bright lights, you know, and they have those episodes of X-Files where, you know, people have gotten abducted and there's just kind of shadows of people standing over them. And that's what I felt like. Uh, I remember kind of after the surgery, I remember telling my mom, like, mom, I was, I was abducted by aliens. And she says to me, Mike, no, you, you had your surgery on your neck and all of this and whatever. Um, but it was 24 hours after that, after my surgery that I got pneumonia. So that's when really when things kind of even got worse than what they already were. Um, so I was sent up to like the, the ICU unit and I kind of had my own room and this is really where I kind of really first started experiencing what was going on. Like I'm laying there, my mom and dad are there. I watched a lot of movies, you know, but really didn't know, but I would have these people come in to do like, you know, stretches on me and chest therapy. But it was really after all of that kind of happened that they would, you know, get me sitting up in a chair and it was really there. I am sitting in a chair and I can't move a damn thing. Like my arms aren't moving. I can move my head side to side, but that was about it. Um, I remember going and they were, you know, doing different stretches and different movements on my arms. And it was one of those things where it's weird to say, I just went with the flow. I just let them do what they, what they needed to do. And I followed their instructions and I did it. And then, you know, from there, you know, being told that, you know, there was a bed free over at Parkwood and, I didn't really know what Parkwood was. I didn't really know there was a rehab hospital. I just knew it was the place to go. Kind of here in London and for surrounding areas. Um, and, and then from there, that's really where life began. That's where I learned everything. We could do a lot of these conversations to try to take the gap between that time and a few years ago. <laughs> So it's like yeah, we're going to, it's like we're going to skip over almost all of Act Two, yeah. which isn't really very fair to do. But there are so many things that I want to get to, and um, so let's just jump to it. That you've settled into this new way of life. I'm sure it evolved in countless different ways. I would guess, anyhow. Shouldn't say I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, over fifteen, twenty years. Eventually, your quest for um, continued is rehabilitation a fair word? 
Um, yeah, it really was. Like, yeah. What, yeah. what your idea of what you're wanting to achieve for yourself uh, takes you out to California. Maybe take me a little bit before that and, and talk about the process of you know rehabbing and what you're doing and, and not just saying I okay I'm, I'm in the wheelchair and maybe even before we do that describe for people um, because a lot of people are going to be hearing this that don't know you uh, maybe the level of level of mobility that you do have or that you did have then and, and how that's progressed and led you to what I just uh, yeah and really okay yeah so I'll go back and just um, you know like I said like learning to you know eat and stuff like that so it was really the occupational therapist at Parkwood that really got me moving again. They taught me uh, how to write, how to type, how to eat, with all those things, and it slowly progressed. So I started off more or less shrugging my shoulders to getting more bicep function back to just more or less moving my arms. Um, and thank goodness, because I'm kind of an arm talker. I'm a hand talker. I like flipping things around. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've luckily got a lot of movement back. Unfortunately, I'm a C4, five, um, quadriplegic, but I've been very fortunate that with my break, um, I was able to get a little bit more wrist function back. So kind of like a wrist extension, um, which now I'm kind of qualified as a, a functional C6 quadriplegic. I don't have finger function and I do not have tricep function. So, there's still a lot of things that what I can do, but what I can't do that limit to me to what I do, what I can and can't do. But me being the person I am, I usually try to find some way of making it happen. Um, so kind of from there. Yeah. I mean, things have just gotten easier and better and, you know, it's a helped me get through school. Like, I mean, I got discharged Saturday, February 15th from Parkwood hospital and the following Monday, I was back in high school and before that, I mean, I was doing my grade 12 English while I was in Parkwood. My mom and my dad decided, you know what, we're not letting them just lay around here and do nothing, even though I was working hard in therapy, but education was very important. And that kind of has led me through my life, um, is that push and that drive. And so, you know, I did that in, while well, I was in the hospital and, and that was great because it was probably the best therapy I probably could have done. Uh, my vocal cords were damaged, so uh, we would record my answers, you know, with 1984 and, you know, Macbeth and all that fun stuff. Um, so my voice got stronger. Um, then we started being able to type my answers out, but also trying to write my answers also to get my writing better. So from there, you know, I was able to get back to school. I was able to graduate high school. I was able to, from there, luckily move on to take civil engineering at Western with Western, I was able to find a job, you know, and it always wasn't in engineering and it probably wasn't, and I'll go back to Western. They were hesitant that I'd be able to graduate in four years and with, with my class and the person that I am didn't want to hear that. And I did graduate in four years with my class. Um, and maybe it is because of that, you know, never give up, you know, my parents, pushing me um, that that is you know more or less drove me to that point looking back civil engineering probably wasn't the best choice for a guy in a wheelchair um, if anybody knows civil engineering uh, it's usually involves a lot of holes it usually involves a lot of scaffolding uh, beams and columns and a guy in a wheelchair is just not going to get up doing all that but I was really more looking into the side of the design side of it I like the imagination of I was always I, I chose civil engineering because I wanted to be that guy that could drive down the highway and say, I designed that building. I helped build that building. Um, and that was kind of me. So moving forward, you know, getting a job, it was tough. You know, you, you give your resume out. I would really never disclose that I was in a wheelchair, um, which in the end made it made it tough because, you know, they'd be like, oh, we love your we love your schooling. You know, you don't have any education, but we've got this job that we can actually you know, have a mentor for you that now, you know, when he's ready to retire, you know, you'll be the guy that steps in. And, you know, once they kind of find out I'm in a wheelchair, a lot of those jobs kind of got wiped away. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? It's probably my own fault. I probably should have disclosed earlier that I was in a wheelchair so that they would have a little bit better understanding, but I really wanted them to see me 
and then let them know about my wheelchair and then let them make that decision for themselves. I wanted them to interview me, understand who I am and my passion and my drive, and then we'll worry about the wheelchair. It went against me in a lot of different ways, uh, but I was very fortunate enough to get a job uh, as an accessibility advisor in Stratford, you know, going through all their buildings that they own or lease and, you know, going through them and really saying, this is how accessible you are. This is what needs to be fixed. Um, and I loved it. And then luckily enough, I got to get a job in, in London here at the March for Dimes, uh, home and vehicle modification department. And that really helps people that, you know, have been injured more or less have somewhere to apply to get funding to help make their home accessible, to make their vehicle accessible. I loved it, you know, especially being someone that lives it every day. You know, you can give your personal experience to these people that are calling, whether it be their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, you know, everyone's got a different situation of it. So it was one of those things where I could sympathize with them. I could let them know my situation. And from there, you know, it was those calls that we could get that, you know, everyone was, you know, everything was working out fine. And, you know, they could get them into the house. They could get them into their bed. And, you know, they're getting those phone calls where the mother is crying on the other end of the phone. And those are the phone calls that I would live for. You know, you might get yelled at a lot, but it was those happy phone calls that, that made the job so worthwhile. Um, and then from there, you know, I was lucky enough to, actually get an engineering job at 3M. Uh, and let's say my parents were very happy because, you know, all that schooling finally came in handy. Um, and I loved it. I loved 3M. But there was so many things that I had done. You know, like I said, I had gone to school. I graduated. I got a degree. I got a job. I had bought a house. Um, but there was a, still a lot missing. Um, I kind of didn't do a lot of therapy during those 15 years of from the time of my accident until I got home. I mean, I would do stretching. I would do all this different stuff. But my will to want to walk by the time I'm age of 40 wasn't going to happen unless I actually did something about it. So that's where California comes in. And I had heard about this place in California that was specializing in spinal cord injury, recovery, more or less understanding your body and how it works and how to control it again. And from there, that's really where I went down there. I went, went down with an open mind, an open thought of, you know what? If nothing happens, nothing happens. If something happens, let's see what I can do with this. So your focus has always been remarkable, Mike. And even, I don't know how closely people are listening. They might've heard all of a sudden some voices in the background and some wrestling that you just carried right on with. <laughs> yeah. just, we had a little bit of a visit here in the office of where we're recording and using as a makeshift studio here at Moving Forward Rehabilitation and Wellness Center. But uh, my hat is off to you for that. We're, we were we were just um, getting to the point where we were talking about your journeys taking you to California. What was it that you were looking for that led you there? Um, it was really that goal of uh, that I had set for myself as a 16-year-old kid uh, that I was going to walk by the time I was 40. And here I was uh, at the age of... Uh, Wait a second. 31. You glossed over that part. <laughs> I was trying to do the math. Or if you said uh, it, I wasn't paying attention. No, the, so 16 is how old you were when you had the accident. Yeah. At what point did you set that goal? Some point in that within that year currently, but from the accident to when you made that decision was... It was in that first year. It was it was really when I was um, in therapy, you know, and you see other people that are the same break as you and they're walking around. And, and, and that's not – it's more or less a motivator, but, but it also is that their break happened and it was different and everything. But that was a motivator for me that, you know what, someone with the same break as me is going to walk again. And that motivated me. Um, but – at the same time, like I had said, there was so many other things driving me to be normal. And I don't mean that in a, in a, in, in the wrong way. Normal is way overrated, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, but to be, to do everything that everyone else can do. And that's what I did. And then really when I got to be, you know, 30, it was 31. It was more or less one of those things where it's like, I got 10 years. This whole goal of walking again isn't going to happen if I don't do anything. 
And that's really what drove me. And then luckily enough, like working at uh, 3M, my bosses were, were great. They were understanding and they, they really looked at it as, you know what, if we can have Mike go to California, improve his health, improve his overall well being and his outlook on life, we'll make him a better employee. And I, I, ta- I, 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 uh, lift my hat off to them or whatever that saying is, um, because they were really looking out for the best for me at the same time. And so again, going down there, I went with an open mind of, you know, whatever happens, happens and getting down there and finding out this is what their program was. And then kind of taking the brain, the nervous system in your body, trying to understand it and reconnect it. Um, but how did you find them in the first place? I, uh, I was actually in Toronto getting some work done on my accessible van. And there was a lady that was there and she actually had just come back from there. And she was a, she was a paraplegic. I mean, she had full upper body movement, but she went down there and she, maybe I think she had been there once or twice before, but she was telling me about the progress that she had made and that, the, you know, now she was crawling and she was in a standing frame and she was in a treadmill that would like support her and, you know, move her legs. And like with the help of the, the assistance of the trainers, I was so overwhelmed. And I was like, you know, a light bulb went off. It was like, damn, like this is what I need. And I more or less went home and I, I looked it up right away. I just, I looked it up and I was like, I need to see what this place is doing so I can see if I can make the right decision. And and really I did. I, I talked to work, I called down there and I more or less booked everything. And I, I I went down there. It was only supposed to be for uh, six weeks. And um, you know, and here I am doing these different movements and exercises and standing in a standing frame. And I'm telling you, standing in a standing frame, was the most remarkable thing I have ever experienced in my life. I wanted to ask you about that. So, um, because you've told me before about what the experience was like when you all of a sudden were up over your feet, when they were underneath you again. So maybe describe to people that have no idea what you're talking about, what a standing frame is. And then Uh, tell me about that experience. Yeah, no, like the standing frame is really kind of a more or less an apparatus that you, you sit in. But it, you, you get your feet strapped in, it supports your knees, your, your legs kind of get strapped into it, and then, and then you get kind of pumped up um, from a sitting position into a standing position. And from there, you're, you're upright, you're looking people in the eye again. And you know, for years, sitting in a wheelchair, you're always looking up at people. So for that first time of being six foot, six one, being able to look at my trainer, who at the time was six four, and looking him in the eye, I'll tell you, they, it, it brought tears and so many emotions to me that I knew this was possible. I knew this was a place that could teach me so many more things than I have ever learned in my entire life. Um, not about me, but about life and about um, making things possible, that anything is possible. Um, if you do it and you put your mind to it, you can move forward in life. So, yeah. Don't you love how that little phone uh, sound totally photobombed the conversation? That's the joys of working in the gym. There's a lot of things going on here at all times. I was going to say, uh, is that your phone or mine or is one yeah, of the trainers probably it, over in the corner? It's one of the trainers, yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, yeah, being down there really opened my eyes to so many things. And it was one of those things where – a six week session. And I learned so much in the first three that I more or less emailed my bosses at 3M and said, yeah, I'm not coming home. <laughs> I said, my sister's weddings in August and I want to be able to stand at her wedding. So how long were you there for? Uh, from that email, luckily I didn't get like an electronic pink slip. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, because they like, again, going back, they understood the situation. Um, and I ended up being there for, for four months. Wow. And, um, down there, I found a chair that would allow me to stand at the same time. And I got home in May and that's when I really understood that, um, what I was doing down there, I could do at home, but it wasn't a hundred percent possible. And to explain that a little bit more is like, we have a lot of great gyms here in London. Mm -hmm. Um, But to be able to go to them, the trainers there didn't understand working with someone with a disability. The equipment wasn't accessible. And luckily enough, I found a personal trainer um, that had worked with someone that, you know, had been a paraplegic and kind of understood the situations. And what we did, we more or less worked 
on the basics that I learned down in California, working on balance, working on core strength. Core strength is so important whether I'm sitting in my chair or whether I'm standing up. Um, and so I worked with her and luckily enough, by the time my sister's wedding rolled around in August, I was able to stand up in the, in the standing chair that I got. And I'll tell you, it was one of the most proudest days, um, I have of myself, um, being there at the front of the, you know, it's kind of emotional. Um, but to be asked by my sister, um, to stand up at her wedding, and to be standing there in front of her, in front of my family. I don't know who cried more, me or her. Um, because I knew I did it. And um, yeah, it was just one of those things I will never forget and be proud of myself about. Um, so that whole experience clearly fundamentally changed you. I could maybe argue with you that there's been a Mike 3.0 yeah. as well. Well, because something something went tilt yeah. in your mind and spirit. You've had a couple of mile markers, it sounds like to me, along this journey that you've described where there's just this moment of clarity that you know now what path you've got to follow or what you've got to explore. Yeah. And I really appreciate, by the way, what you've been saying about 3M. My dad worked there for 37 years. They treated him wonderfully. I was a 3M kid. I still miss getting the the brown paper bags at Christmas with yeah. with the scotch tape and the post-it notes and all yeah. that kind of so stuff. So does my so, family. Uh, <laughs> but at some point, there was another tilt. Aha. Uh-huh. You described how fundamentally different the experience, the equipment, and the process was at that place in California. And then when the tilt came for you, it turned into where we are now. Tell me about that process of what became moving forward. Yeah, it was really after that first experience, I realized um, I need to go back down there again. And I'll make this conversation fairly brief about that, that one. Um, I went down for eight months for that one. Again, it was just to see what else was possible. What else more could I do? Um, and from there, I went down. And from that one, we progressed from the standing frame to freestanding, which is really you take away the apparatus of the standing frame and it's me and my trainer standing on my own, on my own two feet on the floor and looking down at my feet and try not to lose my concentration. Cause you know, I had learned how to lock my knees, how to try to find my butt, how to control my core through all these different exercises to the point where him helping me stand, I was on my own two feet. Um, I was walking on the treadmill trying to, you know, be able to take my own steps, not just the trainers moving me through that, Um, and it was really when my parents came down and my parents, my dad had come down a lot, you know, like I said, he's a truck driver. So, um, fortunately enough, he was able to come down to California. So he had seen me in the gym, but to have my sister, my mom, my dad, my brother-in-law down there watching me and, and stand for the first time and walk for the first time. Um, it was a lot of emotions kind of by everybody. Um, but it was that moment that I realized this needs to happen in London because it wasn't really changing me. It kind of changed my parents. They realized, you know what? All these years had now gone by. Like at that point, it was about 17 years since my accident. You know, and my parents had never given up that one day I'm going to stand. One day I'm going to walk. So to see that, see that emotion that brought to them was really what drove moving forward. When I got home, I realized I can't keep going back to California. One, it's not fair to 3M. And, and two, it was getting to be too expensive. Um, so that's really where I wanted to have a facility in London that could help the community of people that have disabilities, whether that be someone like myself with a spinal cord injury, because down there they really just dealt with spinal cord injuries. But I really looked at it as it was affecting the nervous system. And what we were doing was retraining the nervous system. So this could help someone with a stroke, with a brain injury, Um, with MS, with CP, with ALS, you know, it's a matter of looking at their disability and what we can do to help train them to understand their body to go forward. What's it been like (sighs) since you opened the doors here and the people that have come through that you have probably, you and your team given an experience somewhat similar to what you were able to enjoy in California? Yeah. Describe it. 
um, you know, we opened the doors, you know, October, you know, 2014. And um, the response was overwhelming of kind of like the people that wanted to come here to see really what we could do. And you know what? I, I, I've been very fortunate to be able to find the greatest trainers, you know, that, you know, maybe I've never really worked with people with disabilities, but they want to help people with disabilities. And to have people come through the door with kind of the same open mind as me, you know, obviously they want to walk again, uh, depending on, on their situation, but to let them know that, you know what, this is baby steps. You know, you just don't get out of your chair one day and start walking again. So to be able to take them through understanding their body, understanding how the body works and the body moves to getting them onto the standing frame to getting them in the harness to stand at one of our other apparatuses, um, on the treadmill walking, you know, to see them, that smile, to see those tears in their eyes, to see family come through. For me, it's the best thing really ever, you know, for me to that. I know that I'm helping someone the way my parents have helped me, the way the place in California helped me, the way I can now kind of open up their eyes and their mind that anything is possible. And as long as you push hard enough, you can move forward with life. And that's really, to tell you the truth, where the name came from. I, For me, I was always moving forward in my life. And I will continue to move forward. And that's really where the name of the gym came from. It was just one of those things where it was like, it fits in so many different ways. And though you didn't build this building, you did build this business. So there's a little bit of what you described about with the civil engineering of wanting to go buy a building and say, hey, I built that place. Yeah. Um, I guess anytime you come back to something day after day after day after day after day, it's, it starts to just become what you do. Uh, but there's got to be at least some element there of realizing that this, where we're sitting now and recording this, uh, and everything that you just described, did not exist a couple of years ago. It, no, and, and it did. And you made it exist. I did. Yeah, no, I, I kind of took my background in civil engineering, and when I looked at the at the building, and luckily enough, I you know knew how to do AutoCAD, and I was more or less able to take like the outlines of the building and make it my own. This is where I want the kitchen at, the offices, the two accessible washrooms. Uh, this is where the equipment's going to be laid out. It was all in my mind. I could picture it, even though it was only 2D on paper. I could see it 3D in my mind. Um, so to have it gutted out and rebuilt and the equipment in here going, kind of coming in the doors, uh, you know, even every day it kind of was like, you know what I did that, you know, and it was like, it goes back to why I wanted to do civil engineering, but at the same time, it's like I did that and now I can help so many other people. What other dreams do you have both personally and professionally? Um, you know what, that, that goal of wanting to walk again um, at 40, um, now I'm 36 now, is uh, quickly creeping up on me. But you know what, that's still a goal. And you know what, if it's not 40, it's going to be 45, it's going to be 50. But it's one of those dreams I'm never going to give up on because I know it's possible. I know with the technology nowadays, with the medication and the research, anything's possible. It's just a matter of, the Canadian government allowing it, which sometimes they hold things back. You see a lot more things happening in China, in India, in the U.S. even now. You know, they've kind of accepted uh, stem cell research and more things helping people with disabilities and spinal cord injuries hmm. that I see it being the future. And having the gym, I'm just getting my body prepared for the future. Um and ready for what's going to happen. But you know what? Like if for me, you know what? If I don't ever walk again, at least I know I'm as healthy as I ever am going to be. I've accomplished every goal I've wanted to do. And you know what? I want to be able to get married. I want to be able to have kids so that I can really let them know what I went through, but also push them as much as my parents pushed me. I have one more question I want to ask you before I let you get back to it is, um, if the technology existed to be able to go back in time and talk to your younger self, not necessarily your pre-accident self, your younger self, it's up to you to decide where exactly along the line that is. What would you want to share with him? 
Um, um, it would be more or less to, you know, never give up on your dreams. Uh, to do, if someone tells you you can't, to do it. Um, and to never look back. And the reason I say that is because, you know what, this accident happened and I would never turn back the clock to change it. And a lot of people question me why I would never do that. But it's more or less because of the people I've met, the things I've done, the accomplishes that I've had. Um, it's made me a whole, like a different person. Um, it's maybe a better person. Um, would it be neat to kind of see a parallel life of where I would be at this age and the accident never happened? Yes. Um, uh, but at the same time that can't happen. Um, and you know what, to tell my younger self, all those things, I would hope that he would become the man that I am today. That's as good a place as any, as I can think of to stop Mike. That was fantastic. Thank you for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. You can find and connect with Mike online at movingforwardlondon.com or go to Facebook at Moving Forward London. Or if you're in this area, just go stop by the gym and go see him. They're in the Meadowbrook Business Park off Exeter Road. Pass the word along, would you, so that people who might benefit from that facility will know that it's there. And give them a call or go and drop in on Mike and see for yourself. I know that he would greet you with a warm welcome and you'll be glad that you went to see him. As for me, you can join me online at kevinbolmer.com. You can also use noscheduleman.com. That's sometimes easier to remember and not misspell. Stay in touch by signing up for our monthly e-newsletter. It's absolutely free. It's available on the website. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or SoundCloud. Those are all either at or backslash no schedule man and if you just go to our main website all the links to that social media stuff are, is all listed there as well you can download this podcast at soundcloud.com slash no schedule man thanks again so much for listening we'll catch you next time on the no schedule man podcast just a little deja vu.